I remember distinctly being in Santiago, Chile, giving this talk, and I was talking to a room full of policymakers, social movement activists, government leaders, and so on, and I gave them my argument. I said, electoral incentive, civil society mobilization, and everything I just gave you. And then someone from the audience put up their hand and said, you know, this is a fantastic story about Taiwan and South Korea, except there's one difference between your countries and the countries that we live in here in Latin America. I said, what's that? I said, well, your countries are rich. We're poor. So I had thought I had discovered the truth. I thought democracy was key. I went around selling that message, and then I was told, no, actually, it's not that. So I revised my thesis, and I said, well, maybe it's not democracy. Maybe it is how rich you are. So I talked about fiscal capacity. So then I went around the world saying, okay, it's kind of got to do with democracy, but ultimately what it has to do with, because I learned now, is that it is about fiscal capacity. How rich are not the case, how rich are government? I gave this talk, and I gave this talk in several places in Southeast Asia, and they said, well, you know, Professor Wong, you're wrong. Because here in China, or in Indonesia, or Malaysia, or Singapore, we are pretty rich. And the government is very rich. In fact, our government is richer than your government. That's not the problem. The problem is a question of implementation. And it's a question of political will. So I went back and I thought, okay, so it's got something to do with political will. Maybe what explains the success of Taiwan and South Korea is the previous patterns of growth with equity. And that because we saw rapid economic growth but a relatively equitable distribution of income, this creates the political will that allows for these states to deepen the welfare state. Let me put it this way. I'm probably still wrong, but because I've been beaten up so many times, I'm not taking this road show on the road anymore, and I've decided to just believe that I'm right, and I'm not testing it anymore. <laughs> but chances are, I'm probably wrong. The point is that social scientists make arguments, but we have to have the modesty that these arguments are evolving. That the truth is fundamentally elusive. That in fact we have a lot to learn about our own discipline political science by looking at politics and appreciate untruth, or if you will, uncertainty. So what does this then have to do with Samuel Huntington and Francis Fukuyama? If you think about it, both Huntington and Fukuyama as political scientists are offering us a kind of end of history theory. For Sam Huntington, it's an end of history that results in the irreversible clash of civilizations. That this is just simply inevitable. That the have-nots have now turned to some form of identity fundamentalism that we should expect a clash of civilizations. For Francis Fukuyama, his end of history thesis is much more triumphant. It's a different kind of truth. It's a truth in which the end of history has arrived and liberal capitalism and democracy are the ends of history. Indeed, Fukuyama himself will admit he wrote the piece to provoke. But in some senses as well, what he meant by the end of history was some notion of truth. That there was some certainty in his argument that we had discovered a truth. That there were no alternatives to liberal democracy and capitalism. One problem with this kind of immodesty, and I'm not pointing this at Fukuyama himself, because he himself will say that it was just simply meant to be a provocative argument. But the puppets who buy into Fukuyama's argument, lock, stock, and barrel, the immodesty of those proclamations, of course, is rooted in what is fundamentally a presentist description. It's describing now. And in many ways, it denigrates history. A president's description has a very short notion of history. It's describing what we are seeing now. For those who presume the end of history to be the truth, also bring with them a great deal of satisfaction. 
that the end of history in liberal democracy and capitalism may not be perfect, but it's good enough. And there's something very appealing about that. One of the most high-impact moments I ever experienced was chatting with someone actually a lot like me, although he was of South Asian descent, in South Africa. It's my age. During the early 1990s, he was in the United States going to school. And we had a chance to meet in South Africa, and I asked him, I said, what was it like when South Africa democratized? What did you feel? He said, what do you think I felt? He said, I was like you. In South Africa, under apartheid, he and I, he, was considered a colored person. And because of that, he wasn't able to vote. He wasn't able to participate in full political life. He was studying at Yale. This is no dummy. But he could not participate. He was denied the rights of citizenship. So there should be a sense of satisfaction. It would be wonderful if we could presume the truth. When one, as he described it, goes to bed one night, living under a system of apartheid, and the next day being told that his mother and his grandmother could finally vote. But when we are so self-satisfied, we also in many ways stop progress. If we understand history in this presentist way, if we understand the end of history as this triumphant moment that ends all moments, in other words, by denying the long future ahead of us, then we deny that forever is a long time. To say today that we've arrived at the end of history, that forever there will be no alternatives to what we see today, is in many ways the vein of progress. And indeed, the arrogance of this presumed truth then leads to prescription. That yes, it's absolutely critical that South Africa democratized. That yes, it's absolutely impactful when you hear these stories of someone who looks just like you, was denied the right to vote. And had I been born in the lottery of life in South Africa, I would have been denied the right to vote. It is absolutely true that we should celebrate this, but to presume that history has ended and to presume this in truth leads to a sort of prediction. And all I want to suggest to you is that surely we can do better. In other words, we may want to look forward by looking backwards. That Fukuyama, in many ways, provides for us a very truncated history. It's a history that's bracketed by European civilization. It's a history, really, of not that long and it is a proclamation of the future that is forever. In some ways, maybe we want to return to Marx. Not Marx in terms of the communist revolution or socialism as the end, because we know that that's been discredited. But that what we see today is merely incidental, and that what we need to be concerned about is the future of global capitalism. At the core of global capitalism is the relationship between peoples. Lenin would call it dominance, Marx would call it dominance, Frederick List would call it relative power between nations. Adam Smith would even admit that there is not necessarily a fair distribution of the benefits of market growth. In other words, then, we experience in global capitalism winners and losers. Now, global capitalism, of course, in and of itself, is not a bad thing. I'm off to Ethiopia next week, and one of the things that strikes me as odd and counterproductive is that there is no such thing as property rights in Ethiopia. Property rights, of course, is the very essence of capitalism, but the absence of this property right leads to the capricious use of force by government, taking land away at any given moment, and so on. So the future of global capitalism itself is not a problem. The problem is, are these relative winners and losers? 
I want to suggest to you that as a society, as a global society, and having traveled around the world and doing research on this, as a society, we can in fact tolerate losers. We can tolerate those who are on the relatively short end of the stick. But the fundamental question for us as political scientists is how much can we tolerate? And what kinds of losers can we tolerate? And when is it, notwithstanding the proclamations of the end of history, is the competition fundamentally unfair? And here I want to suggest to you that Francis Fukuyama's argument, not him, but the argument that he makes and the presumed truth that comes with it, with it does not tell us how we deal with society's losers. It does not tell us because in many ways we are satisfied. It's only when, and I want to harp on this again, it's only when we bear witness that we begin to appreciate society's losers. That we begin to appreciate just how dire these situations are and just how imperative it is it, and how imperative it is for us as young students to see this with our very eyes. The argument I'm making is that the end of history thesis as presumed truth obliterates this. It obliterates the imperative to see. It's absolutely, to bear, it's absolutely imperative to bear witness. It's important to appreciate that life expectancy in the south side of Chicago is 60 years old and the rest of Chicago is 77. It's imperative to understand this relationship that a colleague of mine, Tanya Lee, in anthropology has coined, make, live, or let die. To understand that in many ways it is a fundamental choice that we have to make. We can either work hard to make live, or we can simply let those who lose die. Letting die, letting someone die is to make them invisible, and it's far easier to do. We have regaled you throughout this course with statistics, impersonal statistics, and at best it may raise some concern in you, but it should probably raise slightly no more than indifference. The fact of the matter is that making live actually is not all that arduous. It costs seven dollars per person to cover all vaccines, which will increase life expectancy across the board by 20 years. The question then before us is how do we make live? And this is the big question before us. How do we make live? If we are going to decide between making live and letting die, and we choose to make live, the fundamental question before us in the future is how do we make live? The end of history fails to tell us. The end of history tells us nothing. In many ways, it blinds us. The end of history thesis suggests to us that we have arrived at the end, that there is no better alternative, that if so choosing, we can choose to let die, that perhaps making live is too arduous. Don't get me wrong. Markets and democracy are indeed better than all alternatives. Fukuyama's not wrong there. Markets and democracy are, well, are better than all alternatives. But the question before us and the question before you as political scientists is, are they the best? The question before you is, can we do better? Mike Davis wrote a very famous book called The Planet of Slums. In 2002, one billion people on this earth lived in slums, like this. One third of the global urban population lives in a slum. In less developed countries, poor countries around the world, 80% of urban populations live in slums. As I mentioned, I'm going to Ethiopia next week, and I'll be spending a week in Addis Ababa. 99.4% of the urban population, one out of every 200 does not live in a slum. 99.4% of the population, urban population, live in a slum. More than 50% of slum dwellers in Ethiopia are under the age of 20. So the question then is, can we do better? 
We live in a planet of slums because we live in a system in which we have now what anthropologists refer to and economists as a surplus population. There are too many people. They have no land, they have no income, they have no job, they have no social insurance, they are fundamentally invisible. They are, unfortunately, surplus. 92% of those working in India do not work in a formal job. 72% of those working in Brazil do not work in a formal job. They work in the informal labor sector. They have no protection. They have no workplace address. They receive no benefits. We've experienced over the last 20 years what economists call jobless growth. GDP continues to grow, and yet there are no jobs. And you're going to experience this too as you go out in the labor market. We increasingly live in a world of gray income. The rich are getting richer, as I've described to you. And the rich are getting richer in part because they aren't reporting their income. And so therefore then, in the case of China, there are $1.5 trillion circulating in that economy that is invisible. The vast majority of which are owned by the top 10% of the population. The planet of slums that affects a billion people in this world is one in which people are invisible. If one of these one billion were to die, no one would know and no one would care. The point then is, is there truth in political science? Fukuyama is probably right. We probably have arrived at the end of history. He is absolutely right that in the course of our truncated history, there are no better alternatives than democracy and capitalism, or at least the pundits who support it would argue. What I want to suggest to you is that notwithstanding understanding Fukuyama is right, must we understand it as a truth? Because when we understand it as a truth, then we are not only describing what is, but we are also describing what should be. And it's this self-satisfaction that makes political science courses boring. It's what makes political science boring. That you're just learning what others before you have written. It's this self-satisfaction that obliterates the audacity that we can do better. Is there truth in political science? And I would say to you, no. That we have a lot to learn about the uncertainties of what we do as a profession. There is no truth in political science. And we need to be more modest in ever thinking that there is such things as truth. All we do in political science, and indeed I hope that all of you continue on in political science, all we do in political science is we make arguments. We marshal together evidence and we argue. We perceive the world, we understand the world through different lenses, and if given the opportunity, I, I hope all of you have the opportunity to bear witness. But as political scientists, we must also believe we can do better. Not just that there is no truth, but to believe that there can be no truth, because otherwise, we will stop striving to do better. I hope to see all of you around. Professor Cox and I thoroughly enjoyed being with you over the last year. It was great having you. Good luck on your exams.